Greetings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church on behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, our Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, each officer and member of this church. We're just so blessed that you are joining us for our general Sunday School lesson overview. For the last four years now, we have just been sharing uh, the Word of God through our Sunday School lesson over our Facebook and YouTube pages. And for those of you all that have been following with us, we thank you for your presence and for your support, but most uh, definitely for your prayers. Uh, each of our Sunday school classes are continuing to meet uh, virtually, either through conference call or Zoom. And so if you want more of a traditional lesson, more of an interactive lesson with other students where you can ask your instructor questions, by all means, leave a message in the chat or give us a call and we'll help you find a class that can meet your needs. But again, we are, uh, are so blessed that God has given us not only the ability, but the technology to share these lessons. And so today is another one of those lessons. It's, it's entitled, The Greatest Gift, taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 13, and Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Uh, this lesson is amazing, and it really focuses on the love of God and what God has called us to do. If we remember, and we'll get to this later, uh, Jesus said himself when he was asked, what is the most important commandment? That we love God with all our heart and that we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And so today's key verse is taken from Romans chapter 13, verse 9. It reads, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so this lesson is taken from two different uh, books of the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 13, and Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. It is our goal today that first we will examine how love is the supreme expression of our faith. Secondly, we will commit to growing in love for God, ourselves, and our neighbors. And third and finally, we will commit to showing love in our day-to-day -day living, to be examples of love as we go about our lives. And so we'll start with prayer and jump right into this lesson, and we just pray that God blesses each and every one of us, that we might fully understand or better understand his role and his work for our lives, and that we might be committed to showing love in even a greater scale as we go about our day-to-day -day work. And so let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day another opportunity to study your word. Father, we thank you for friendship, for our leadership, for our pastor, our superintendent, for giving us the vision to just send out these lessons in hopes that we might be uh, better doers of your word. Father, we ask that you bless each and every person that's listening or watching right now, that we might be strengthened according to your purpose for our lives, that we might be able to be lights shining in the midst of darkness, that we might understand your word so that we can be stronger and equipped enabled soldiers on the battlefield fighting to spread your gospel message and to stand against the forces of evil. Now, fathers, we break into your lesson. Empty us out. Whatever does not belong, replace it with your love, with your wisdom, and with your word so that we might be equipped to stand strong and face the challenges of today. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, uh, uh, there's a desire amongst all believers that we understand and grow in our spiritual gifts. Uh, many of us, as we become more mature in our faith, we have a desire to be useful by God, to be useful in our ministries. And we want to grow in the areas that God has called us to and God has gifted us in. If you're a choir member, that you want to practice your singing, you want to mature your voice, you want to do what you can to become a better singer. If you're a preacher, you want to study the Word of God, you want to dwell in the Word of God, watch other preachers, watch other sermons, go to school and grow so that we can be better and more effective communicators of God's Word. And it doesn't matter what area in the ministry that God has called you to serve. If you're in the kitchen committee, you want to be a better cook. If you're an usher, you want to be a better usher. If you're in the sound ministry, you want to be a better sound or video technician. Wherever God leads us as we take our faith more seriously and we value the work that God has called us to our desire is to be more effective and the problem that arises from time to time is the enemy will allow us to focus on the work and not the people and it doesn't matter if you're the most effective preacher if you're living so highly that you can't reach the people low then what role are we playing 
Uh, the, it makes no sense for us to be so gifted and so talented, but we ignore the very people that God has called us to serve. And so we have to recognize that God gives us these gifts, that God allots us these gifts and these talents, not for our own glory or for our own purpose, or so that we can build ourselves up or even our ministries, but he gives us these things so that we can be better or more effective in reaching out to others and sharing the gift of love and bringing those that are lost out of darkness and into the marvelous light. And so God gifts us all according to his purpose for our lives, and we are each gifted and we're able to grow so that we can be better lovers of people. And so again, we're not gifted so we can be better preachers or better singers. We're gifted so that as we grow in those areas and in those gifts, the love that we have for others becomes more transparent and, and, and more attractive and more uh, magnetizing that others might be drawn in to the uh, love of God through the gifts that he has given us. So this love that God gives us, it translates in the way that we interact with God, with ourselves and our neighbors. And so we want to make sure that in this lesson that we understand that God gives us these gifts so that we can be better equipped to love, so that our love can shine brighter than it has the day before. So our lesson is broken down into three different parts. The first part comes from the First Corinthians chapter 13 passage, and then the second and third parts come from the Romans chapter 13 passage. And so we'll jump back and forth, but all of our scripture will be read in the New King James Version. So the first part of our lesson is entitled, The Greatest of All Things, taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 13. The text reads, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. So Paul makes it clear with his first declarative statement that love never fails. And it speaks to the, uh, the eternal uh, state of this uh, attribute of love, that it, that it lasts forever. There are very few things in this world that are eternal. And uh, Paul outlines or he identifies that the gifts that we are given by God, that they are temporary, they are fleeting, that they are not eternal. And so the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given by God to meet the needs of the moment. We are not gifted by God for our own glory, but rather, instead, we are gifted by God for his glory and for the furtherance of the gospel message. So again, the reason why God gives us these gifts, the reason why God blesses us, the reason why God gives us the talents and the abilities, the resources that we have been blessed with, is not so that we can glorify ourselves or enrich ourselves or lift ourselves up, but so that we can be better equipped to meet the needs of those that God sends our way, to be uh, sharers of this gift of love. Uh, these gifts, and I know we don't want to look at them that way, but they are imperfect gifts given and used by imperfect people to respond to an imperfect time. Again, imperfect gifts given and used to an imperfect people for an imperfect time. Even the best preacher is still imperfect. Even the best singer is still imperfect. The best teacher is still imperfect. For all fall short of the glory of God. Yet God gifts us in spite of our shortcomings in spite of our past, in spite of our mistakes, even in spite of the sins that we are and will still commit, God gifts us so that we can be useful for his purpose and for his glory. These gifts are not meant to prop ourselves up. It's not meant to separate us as the elite and the non-elite or the best and the good and the poor and the bad. But these gifts are meant to equip us to be better doers of God's word. There are limits to the abilities that God gives us, and we have to recognize that in spite of those limits, in spite of those imperfections, in spite of our own shortcomings, God can still use us to do crazy things. I love when we look at the Bible and we look at the, how God used imperfect people when the Philistine army and Goliath was laughing and mocking our God. It was a young shepherd boy who was not a soldier that God sent to slay that giant with a slingshot and a rock. When God's people were held captive for 400 years in Egypt, 
God sent a stuttering man, Moses, to give a speech that has lasted thousands of years when he proclaimed before Pharaoh that my God has said, let my people go. And so God has shown us time and time again that regardless of where we fall short, God can strengthen us in spite of our shortcomings and gift us and give us the abilities and the talents to overcome our shortcomings and be effective in doing the work of the Lord. And so Paul is saying that don't get caught up on these gifts. Don't get so caught up on your abilities. Don't get so caught up on your talents because even the best of us, when we master and, uh, and become uh, uh, better doers of those uh, and users of those gifts and talents, we're still imperfect. We still fall short. And so he tells us to not hang our hat on those gifts or on those talents because those will pass away. Their prophecies will cease, their tongues will cease, but they will be love that lasts forever. So there's a theological debate that takes place within this text on whether the tongues and prophecies will cease with the disciples or the apostles at the time in this early church age or, when they, or whether they will cease when Jesus comes again. And so uh, in a traditional conservative Baptist church, we tend to navigate away from the signs, uh, the, the sign gifts, the laying on of hands and the speaking of tongues. However, I'm a full believer that there are no limits in the power of the God that we serve. And even though those things were more prevalent during the early church age and they don't, uh, they may not be as prevalent as they were then and now, it doesn't mean that God doesn't still have use for them. One of the things that we must remember is the purpose of these signs and gifts, and Jesus said it was so that they may believe, and I'll come to that later on in this lesson. But at the time of the, the writing of this New Testament, during the first three, 400 years, there were no readily accessible copies of God's word, especially the New Testament. And so the Old Testament was written in very few places. They were kept in the temples and were only read by the priests and then it was still written in Hebrew when the royal language had now switched to Greek. And so it was very difficult for the common person or the lay person to understand or read or study the word of God outside of going to worship at the temple. And then based on your heritage or your culture or whatever uh, acceptable practice was going on during that time at whatever city you were in, there was limited opportunity to enter into temple and really hear people expound on the gospel message. And so the church was growing at such a pace where people were longing and desiring to know more and hear more. And every time you heard one thing preached, you would kind of hold on to that thing and chase after it. And so these signs and miracles were being performed so that those that doubted or those that were confused could have clarity and see the wonderful and the awesome power of our God, how God would use common people to do great things. And it was a transformative practice that would take place in our lives when we witnessed the power and the miracles of God. Now that God has given us access, now that we have unfettered access to the word of God, probably now more in 2023 than at any other time in the history of humanity, uh, we can see how God's word is available to us and we can see the power and the miraculous work of God through the printed word. Now, just because God has given us the printed word, again, it doesn't mean that God does not still work through miracles day by day. As a matter of fact, I think many of us can testify that we are a living miracle, that there was somebody that threw us out or cast us away, a doctor that said we wouldn't make it, a lawyer that said that nothing could be done, and we are living examples that God can perform miracles in our lives day by day. I can tell you some times in my life where I shouldn't have made it out or shouldn't have come through, but God, in spite of myself, in spite of my bad decisions, in spite of the circumstances around me, God saw fit to bless me through those difficult situations. And so I can be a witness that God still is in fact performing miracles even in, in, in today. So uh, we, we have to recognize that God gives us these gifts and these talents, regardless of where you stand on the sign gifts, on the sign talents, on the wonders, that God gives us these things so that we can be uh, uh, doers of his word, so that we can be better equipped to spread the gospel message, to show love, and to move those that are in lost out of darkness into light. So Paul moves on and he said, when that which is perfect will come, 
And he alludes to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So we know that Jesus Christ is the only man that was ever perfect uh, on this earth. And on our best day, using our best gifts, we still fall short of the glory of God. So Paul talks about when the, uh, that who is perfect or will come, it will be a time when all believers at the second coming of Jesus Christ will be raptured to heaven and we'll be able to dwell in the presence of God our Father for all of eternity. The Bible says that no man knows the day nor the hour, but Jesus Christ will come like a thief in the night and that the trumpet shall sound and all that are alive shall be raptured into heaven. And as believers, we look forward to that day even though we have no idea when it will come. So at that time, when that moment happens, there will be no more need for the gifts that God has given us because each and every believer will be perfected before God and there will be nothing left to do but worship God for all of eternity. No more preaching, no more converting, no more spreading the message because we will have full access to God and be glorified before him in his presence. And so these part-time imperfect gifts will be done away because there will be no need for them. Paul then moves on to the progression that should be evident in the life of a mature believer. He says, uh, or he speaks about the differences in what is both expected and accepted in the lives of children and adults. He says, when I was a child, I thought as a child, spoke as a child, when, when, when I became a man, I put away childish things. And, and we have to be honest, children are expected to do childish things. One of the things that I had to understand in youth ministry is there has to be some flexibility as much structure and discipline that we want to put in place, we have to be mindful that these are still children and they'll make mistakes, they'll do things that they shouldn't do, they'll say things that they shouldn't say and we have to have the compassion and the grace, the same grace that God gave us when we were at that age and still God gives us today even as adults. We have to, be, uh, the, the, we have to make sure that we're not too harsh and too hard on them and we give them an opportunity to develop and grow into the people that God has called them to be. So I can think of all the things that were common in my childhood that would lead me to utter destruction as an adult. My parents would give me lunch money for the week. On Monday, I would spend it all. If I did that as an adult, I wouldn't be able to pay my bills, and I would have difficulty living in my home or uh, going about my day-to-day -day life. Uh, the same thing about the way that I would throw a temper tantrum if I didn't get my way. If I didn't get my ice cream or my mom didn't stop me from crying at two, three years old, I would just throw a temper tantrum, fall out until either I, I tired myself out or I got my way. Whereas adults, we don't have that luxury. We, we have to be responsible to ourselves. And in those moments where things aren't going our way, we have to just figure out a way to keep on pushing and keep on trucking along. And so as adults, we have become accountable not only to ourselves, but to our loved ones. And our responsibilities are not our own self, uh, our, our, our responsibilities override our own selfishness and the desires of the world. And so Paul makes it clear that as we mature in our faith, the, it should be evident that we are no longer like what we used to be. Now this... Uh, these verses, when I was a child, I thought I was a child, speaking as a child, but now that I am an adult, put away childish things. It's used in so many different ways, and it has many implications. As believers, we should know more about our God today than we did the moment that we first put our hand in the preacher's hands and announced our belief in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. As, 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 as Christians... We should, if we have one verse that we memorized three years ago, we should at least have two by now. There should be an evident progression in our faith. As we matriculate through uh, elementary and high school, my math becomes better each year. I might have learned how to count in kindergarten or knew my numbers. I might have known how to multiply in first and second grade. But if all I can do is multiply when I get to high school, I've missed out on something. I should be able to divide, understand the FOIL process, or have some type of basic concepts of algebra and geometry. And, and, and if I don't, it means that I'm not growing. And what sense does it make to go to school every day, to do your homework, to pass your classes, and there be no evidence of growth? And as believers, it's the same way. Even though we won't be perfected until we get to heaven, as we move about our day-to-day -day lives, if we are in fact believers of God's word and doers of God's word, there should be evidence of growth in our lives so that we can see a difference today. That's why most of the time when you hear me pray, I'll include this phrase, I pray that I'm better tomorrow than I was the day before. And it's an acceptance and an acknowledgement that I'm still falling short, that God is still working on me, that I'm a work in progress, but as a believer, I have a responsibility to move closer to God and further away from sins in this world. So, as uh, the ability, uh, the maturity that we're looking for, 
or the signs of growth in Christ, it's the ability to say no when we want to say yes. And it's the ability to say yes when the world suggests we should say no. Paul recognizes that even as believers, our vision and our understanding is clouded with some things being withheld. And we call these things the mystery of our faith or the mystery of our gospel. And it's not that God means to confuse us or obfuscate our vision, but some things are better left in the hands of God. And we continue to follow and believe in him based on the hope, the faith and the love that we have for God. And one day we will have full vision. And when we see God in our perfected state, when we are in heaven for all of eternity, there will be no more need for the gifts that God has given us because we will no longer need to share or convert, but we will only have uh, time to worship. So this reference of seeing a mirror, it speaks to the early technology that was in place at the time of our lesson. Usually, uh, culturally at least, uh, in the early first century, when this uh, book was written, uh, Mirrors were made of bronze or polished uh, metals with very poor clarity, and the image would always be distorted. In the world in which we live in today, our faith, our living, even our best efforts, they fall short. They are distorted. However, God gives us these gifts to work through our shortcomings and to work, th work through our insufficiencies. And as we move closer to the day of judgment, or the moment when we are called from labor to reward, Paul, uh, Paul makes it clear that then we will see clearly. Then we will have full vision and full understanding of who God is and what God is in our lives. And so even though we have a glimpse of God, God made it clear when he appeared to Moses as a burning bush that we are not as human beings able to even comprehend the full glory of God. And so we see things clear, uh, 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 clouded now, but one day we'll move from a clouded vision into a clear, into a clear vision. And so Paul then, de declare, de excuse me, Paul then declares that it will be at that moment that God's glory will be fully revealed to all believers, and we will know God in the fullness of his glory as perfectly as we can for all of eternity. So in this cycle of life for believers, even as we mature, we will not fully understand and know God until Jesus returns and we find ourselves in heaven forever. So Paul concludes this portion of our lesson, the First Corinthians portion, by suggesting that while we wait, or better yet, as we move closer to the second coming of Christ, we do not depend on our gifts or take for granted those gifts that God has given us, but rather we abide, we dwell in, and we are consumed by faith, hope, and love. So we should not chase after these gifts. Even as God gives us the ability to perfect them, our goal is not to be uh, find rest or comfort in those gifts. We don't even use them as evidence of our faith but we use them as a product of the working of God in our lives so that we can be a better effective in his work and his will and the purpose that he's taught us to do. Instead of focusing on those gifts as the evidence of our faith, we should recognize them as products of our faith and instead focus on faith, hope, and love. So faith is to believe in what we cannot see. Hope is to know what has been hidden and love is to put others before ourselves, regardless of the cost. The reason why Paul says that the greatest of these gifts is love is because one day, when hope and faith have fulfilled their purpose through the return of Jesus Christ, all that will remain in the life of believers is love. God's love for us, his children, and our love for God, and then our love for each other. Faith and hope, they get us through this world that we live in, and they move us closer to heaven. But love allows us to navigate clearly through the entire process. It comforts us, and it dwells in us and through us for all of eternity. Faith and hope are what God allows us to strengthen our walk and encourage us along our daily doings. However, these attributes are not of God, because God does not need faith or hope, because he knows all. But instead, God gives us faith and hope so that we can be led to God or be move along our path as we get closer to God. Love is the only attribute of God listed here that God not only gives to us, but that God actually requires of us. When we live by love, God is guiding us and leading us, and we are sharing the same gift that God has given us when he gave us Jesus uh, to die on the cross when, by loving others in the same way that God loved us. So the first part of our lesson was the first Corinthians uh, 13 part entitled The Greatest of All Things. 
The second part of our lesson, we move to Romans chapter 13, and it's entitled The Continual Debt of Love. Romans 13, 8 reads, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Amen. So after spending the first seven verses of Romans 13 outlining the believer's responsibility to government as citizens, Paul makes it clear that we owe nothing to anyone except to love them. We carry this obligation before God and each other, owing the act of love to others based on the greatest act of love that was ever shown when God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and Jesus gave his life for our sins. Because when we receive that act of love, we have a responsibility to reciprocate it or pay it back. Uh, this phrase or common term that has been moving about for about the last 15 years is called pay it forward. It's a common phrase, and it's used to encourage people to not look to repay acts of kindness, love, and charity, but instead pass the gift on by showing our own acts of kindness, love, and charity in the lives of the people that God brings into our way. When we look to understand our responsibilities as, as followers of Christ, we are called to love each other without limits or conditions, not to be loved, but to love regardless of how we feel, how we're treated, how inconvenient it may be or how much it may cost us. Just yesterday, I was speaking to someone that had a wonderful opportunity for me, and I was telling him how much I appreciated it. Even if the opportunity, opportunity doesn't pan out, I appreciated him even thinking of me and giving me a chance. And I said, don't worry, if it does work out, I know how to show gratefulness, and I'll make sure that I'll show you how thankful I am. He said, don't worry about me. If you want to pay me back, be a blessing to your church, be a blessing to your ministry. And I said, the Lord has called me to do that anyway. I'm going to do that, but I still want to show you how thankful I am. And he said, Tommy, stop. I don't want nothing. Just pay it forward to someone else. Not because he's rich and a millionaire doesn't have any needs, but because he's accepted the fact that God has already given him everything that he needs, that God has given him more than he needs. And instead of being greedy and taking the opportunity to be repaid a blessing that he sent my way, his only request is that I take that blessing and use it to be a blessing to someone else. That's really the summary of Christianity, that God has loved us enough to send his son to die on the cross for our sins. And through that love, we have now been saved from the sins, from our sins and from the, the uh the, uh, the, the results of those sins, uh, uh, the, the saved from this world, saved from eternal damnation. If we do, in fact, appreciate what God has done, and sometimes we have to take a step back and really comprehend and understand the work that God has done in our lives. Once we comprehend it, understand it, and begin to appreciate it, God is saying, listen, don't worry about paying me back. We'll spend all of heaven and all of eternity together, and I'll get mine. But use these gifts, use these talents, use these resources, use the blessings that I have given you to be a blessing to someone else. And that's why I'm so excited about the work that we're doing here at Friendship. As Pastor Back is about maybe about three or four deacons meetings ago, we were just sitting there as a team talking about how much God has blessed us through this pandemic, that some churches didn't survive, that some stru churches struggled to move week to week, but God has blessed us where we're coming out the pandemic looking better than we did when we went in. And because of the blessings of God in this building, Pastor Backus said, I just want to be a blessing to the community. And since that meeting, we've given away $50 gift cards so people can get food, over 350 pair of shoes, up and down Canal Street and the Pacific Garden Mission, being a blessing to those that are uh, uh, displaced from their homes. Uh, uh, th uh, 30 Thanksgiving dinners we're in the process of collecting for right now. Just time and time again, the Halloween fellowship, alternative fellowship that we did at the Fall Festival of Fun here, where we were able to give kids a safe and a Christian environment to still celebrate the holiday. And so as God has blessed us, instead of using it to pay, uh, increase salaries or instead of using it to uh, buy new equipment for the church, Pastor said, let's take these blessings and be an impactful presence in our community and help those that are in need. And that's just the summary of how you share the love of God and what God has called us to do as believers. So when we grow to the point where we can love one another, 
We fulfill God's law and we fulfill God's purpose for our lives and we become better stewards of what God has given us with. And so again, God has gifted us these talents, these gifts, these resources, all these things that we can use. And instead of using them to lift ourselves up or to enrich ourselves or to pat ourselves on the back, God tells us to use these gifts to better equip ourselves to be better doers of his word and share the love of God. So we looked at the greatest of all things. We looked at the continual debt of love. But we conclude our lesson by looking, uh, uh, by saying that cause no harm to our neighbor. Romans chapter 13, verses 9 through 10, the text reads, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. If there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Amen. So Paul here, he begins verse 9 by listing five of the Ten Commandments. Laws that are obviously designed to prevent sin against one another. Paul says for the best way for believers of these commandments, for believers of Jesus to follow these commandments, is by loving our neighbors in the same way that we love ourselves. Now this is not a time to play devil's, devil's advocate. Unless we are a masochist who finds gratification and pain and humiliation, the majority of people, the majority of society, prefers to be treated fairly and right. Even the most introverted of people prefers good times over bad times. Paul makes it clear that if we want to be followers of Christ, if we want to be obedient to God's law, we are best served by loving others in the same way that we want to be loved. This fulfillment of God's law is prescribed in Jesus Christ's words himself. When he was asked by the leaders of the synagogue to explain which commandment is the greatest, Jesus responded by saying that we should love our God with all of our mind, heart, and soul, and that we should love our neighbors as we love ourselves. How do we want to be loved? The answer is very simple. We want to be loved by being treated fairly. We want to be loved by people uh, doing things for us when we need help, when people assisting us when we need help. Uh, if, if a door is too heavy to open, we want someone to help us open it. If we're carrying too much in the church, we want somebody to help us get our beds in. If we're having a bad day, we want somebody to smile and encourage us. If we're struggling in the area, we want someone that is efficient in that area to offer assistance. We know what love looks like. We know what we need and what we want. Uh, just the other day, I was looking at a, 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 a woman at the grocery store. I'm walking down the aisle into the self-checkout line. And she's in a cart, one of those uh, driving carts. And she, the, the, the cereal that she wanted was at the top shelf. And I saw her reach for it, couldn't get it. I saw her try to lift herself out of her chair, couldn't do it. And she looked to her left and right. There was no one there to help. And she just kind of sank in her chair. And you could tell her frustration with her own limitations, whether or ever health uh, issues that she was struggling with. You can tell her frustration that there was no one there to help. And she just kind of looked helpless. Now, I was making my way to the self-checkout line, and there were like three or four people coming behind me. And I knew if I didn't get in there first, I was going to have to wait for them. And for some reason, like always, we're in a rush to go nowhere. It had nothing to do after that. And so instead of trying to run so I could be first in line, I kind of shrugged my shoulders, went to help the lady. She didn't even say thank you, and then I went back. And I realized I didn't do it so she could say thank you. I didn't do it so that I could save three or I didn't, I didn't, I, I, even though it may have cost me two or three minutes in my schedule, it was the right thing to do because maybe one day I'll be in that position where I'll need someone to come help me when I'm not able to help myself. And even though it appears she might have been ungrateful, she even kind of had an attitude with me when I was trying to ask her which one she was reaching for. But that's not the reason why we do it. We're not doing it so that we can be repaid. Not only do we do it so we can help her meet her needs and show her love even when she wasn't expecting it or may not even have appreciated it, but they might have been someone else that was watching me, that because of my act of kindness, my act of sacrifice, now they're motivated to do the same thing when the next opportunity presents themselves, itself in their lives. Perhaps the thing that's wrong with this world right now is too many of us are too busy, too selfish, too minding our own business to worry about the next person. But when we're in need, we'll expect someone to come and help us and offer a helping hand. And so that's what love looks like, to do for others what we would want someone to do for us, even if it's inconvenient for us. Finally, we conclude this lesson by cutting off all questions. What does love look like? What if they don't understand my love? What if I love differently? 
Paul makes it clear. Love does no harm to your neighbor. The purpose of the commandments were not only to keep the children of Israel righteous before the Lord, but it was also meant to prevent uh, harm from being done to one another. The best way we can understand how to love and what love looks like is to see how people are after we interact with them. It is impossible to meet Jesus and not be recipients of his love. The Gospels are filled with people who met Jesus and their lives were changed from that interaction. In the same manner as believers, if we are following the instructions of God, we are called to love, to leave people better off than when we met them. And their interactions of us, there should be no pain left behind. All they should be able to see is that I felt the love of God through that conversation, through that smile, through that hug, through that look, through that interaction. I was able to see God's love. What a wonderful lesson. This lesson is not meant to tear down the gifts of the talents that God has given us. By all means, perfect and grow in those gifts so that we can be better, more useful to God for his purpose in our lives. But we don't chase after gifts and talents. Our purpose is not to become the best singer so that we can make an album and make millions of dollars. Our purpose is not to become the best preacher so we can have more members in our church than the church down the street. Our purpose is to show the love of God. And I guarantee you, if in fact we live a life focused on showing the love of God, God will gift us according to his purpose and we'll be able to accomplish more through love than we could through the best of our talents and gifts. Amen. Thank you, as always, for worshiping with us in our Sunday school lesson. Uh, we encourage you to also support uh, the work that we're doing here as Friendship. Even in this lesson, I've outlined some of the amazing things that we're doing. Right now, we're in the process of raising $3,000 towards the goal of feeding 30 families with full Thanksgiving dinners. We partner with the Jewel Osco on Madison, right in Oak uh, o o Park. And it's our prayer that you would consider supporting the work of this ministry. Uh, we're going to have some wonderful things going on through the Thanksgiving holiday, through the Christmas holiday. And so uh, our angel tree is coming up with our woman of faith where we uh, give uh, uh, toys and Christmas gifts to children of incarcerated parents. So just so many opportunities to be, uh, 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 to sow a good seed in fertile ground and, and, and be a blessing to those that are in need. So I encourage you to consider giving and supporting the work here at Friendship. Four ways that you can be a blessing and donate towards this ministry through Cash App, Dollar Sign Friendship Chicago, through our website, www.fbcchicago.org. You can text the word GIVE to 773-992-1462, or as always, you can mail your check or money order to the church, Friendship Baptist Church Care, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois 606. Four, four. As always, we encourage you to join us for our other worship opportunities throughout the week at 11 a.m. each Sunday morning. Our live and virtual worship experience uh, takes place where you'll hear some of the best preaching this side of heaven. On Tuesday mornings at 8 a.m., we have our prayer call led by our senior associate, Reverend Aaron Davidson. The phone number and access code are on your uh, screen. We call out the name of each person on our sick and shut-in list and ask for God's will to be done not only within our church community but throughout all of creation. Each Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., our brotherhood meet led by uh, Reverend uh, De excuse me, Deacon James Lucas. You can reach out to the church for that information. They have Bible study, and they go over so, uh, several men's topics. And then the fourth Tuesday of each month, our Women of Faith meet. I just mentioned them. They have their Bible study. They do acts of service throughout the year with the next act coming up as Angel Tree Ministry. And then each Wednesday evening, taught by our own pastor, Dr. Backus, you'll have our evening Bible class as we're currently moving through uh, uh, work or study on evangelism. As always, we thank you for joining us. We pray that God has been uh, opened up your eyes to convince us and encourage us to be uh, better sharers of his love as we uh, celebrate the love that God has given us when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. Uh, again, we encourage you to join us just shortly at 11 a.m. for our worship experience. And if the Lord says the same, we'll see you back next Sunday, same channel, same time for another general Sunday school lesson overview. If nothing else, let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the opportunity to study your word. Father, we confess that we've fallen short, but we thank you that in spite of our shortcomings, you have loved us enough to give us brand new graces and brand new mercies each and every day. Father, we ask that this lesson just permeate within our spirits, within our minds, within our souls, within our hearts, that we be convinced that the greatest gift that you have given us is love and that we share that love 
by being lights in the midst of darkness, by treating others in the same way that we want to be treated. Father, strengthen us according to your purpose and give us what we need to face the challenges of tomorrow. And we'll be so careful to give you the glory and the praise in each and everything that we say, that we do, and that we think. Father, we've entered this place to worship and study. We enter to serve. So strengthen us as we face the challenges of this world. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful, amazing week. We'll see you at 11 a.m. for our worship experience. And if the Lord says the same, next week, same time, same channel. God bless.